Are you really sure, Tikhan? Maybe you'll change your mind. You know what a hassle it will be. You won't handle it easily. Remember my words. No, Fyodor Ilyich, I've long decided for myself. I'll keep working here. And I won't go anywhere else. No more hiding from danger and sacrificing others for myself. You know, I'm not afraid of wolves. And I won't avoid the forest. Tikhan replied to his superior. Well, if you change your mind. I'll understand, and I won't judge you. I'll send you some provisions and ammunition in a few days with the boat. Make sure the communication always works. And in general. Don't mess with unnecessary stuff. Goodbye, said the chief. Hunting grounds, but I'm there only when fate wills it. We'll see each other. God willing, Tikhan replied and shook the old man's hand. Then he stood up, took the papers with area data from the table. And left the chief's office. Fyodor Ilyich, the head of the department. Watched him with his gaze until he reached the door. He secretly crossed himself. He knew that the area Tikhan inherited was dangerous. Infamous, and had a bad reputation. Tikhan's predecessors, who had been there before him, were killed this spring. The case became high profile, and the regional prosecutor's office got involved. Various inspections and investigations were carried out. There was a lot of noise, but little progress. With time, the passion settled. And some of the more cunning investigators assumed that Tikhan was at fault himself, claiming he accidentally shot himself. Oh, but how is it even possible? Petrovich? He's been in his position for almost half a century. And he supposedly doesn't know how to handle a weapon. The experienced hunters and trappers wondered openly. A sense of unease gnawed at Fyodor Ilyich. He understood that Tikhan was being sent to a dangerous area. And he was essentially sending the young man to his death. Something wasn't right in that area. And his old heart sensed trouble. Someone else should have been sent there. Tikhan was a good lad, young and still hot-headed. He could chop wood recklessly. Oh, but now it's useless to say anything. And it's as if they're turning his soul inside out. It's unfortunate, thought Ilyich with a heavy heart. Meanwhile, Tikhan was resolute. He wasn't afraid before. And he was incredibly difficult to intimidate. Those who knew him personally noted his stubborn character. And bulldog tenacity. After all, being an Ager was more than just a position. It was a way of life with its own laws of the forest. But what do I have to lose? A child of the orphanage. Just a speck on this vast earth, a piece of the taiga, Tikhan sadly thought. He had recently buried his wife and was now tormented by the agony of his conscience. He tried in every possible way to alleviate the pain of his soul. What could he do? Oncology always strikes from the shadows. Leaving almost no chances of recovery. No matter which doctors he turned to. No matter where he went, it was all in vain. The accursed disease devoured her within just six months. After burying his spouse, Tikhan became a recluse. Hiding from the eyes of people in the taiga. He didn't want to invoke pity and sympathy from the villagers. But when he heard about Agar and Petrovich's death, he couldn't remain indifferent. He submitted a request for a transfer to his area. After all, he owed everything to him. Petrovich had been his mentor many years ago. Able to recognize the 17-year-old boy's love for nature and forest inhabitants. As they say, a fisherman spots another fisherman from afar. Look, Tikhan, do you see the hoofprints of the elk? Divided in such a way. It means he's heading towards the key of gang. He loves to wallow in the mud, a real sloven. But look, there's a squirrel's stash with nuts in that hollow. And further, a chain of fox tracks. I bet she was hunting for a hare. Fox, Mrs. Patrikivna, with a lesson, Petrovich explained to young Tikhan. 
The lad nodded in agreement, pleased with the knowledge he gained. But also remember that you should not be afraid of animals. You should respect them. They sense fear and immediately pounce. If they detect weakness, added the old Agar. It's worth mentioning that. The teachings of Antip Petrovich played a significant role in the young Agar's life. He had encountered wild boars on the same path. Escaped from the formidable Shatten bear. If you don't protect yourself, Petrovich, who will, sighed Tikhon bitterly. Looking over the area records. Despite his connection with the forest, he still had to deal with paperwork. For example, getting licenses ready for the start of the season. The population of deer, moose, and roe deer had to be counted. And each predator registered. The instructions of old Agar had not been forgotten by Tikhon. He once encountered a wild boar on the same trail. And managed to elude a bear. Why don't you protect yourself, Petrovich? Tikhon sighed. Looking at the account sheets. The territory was handed over to Tikhon right around winter. So trudging knee-deep in snow to fully survey the area was quite a task. With the barking dog at his side, they didn't venture far. Limiting themselves to inspecting tracks at the forest edge. Tikhon had already acquainted himself with the local hunters. Who were mostly seasoned and experienced. Knowing the ins and outs just like him. We'll issue a hunting permit, Tikhon knew that the predators. Which were already in the minority. Would not be taken without control. Preserving the balance of the forest. But, as the saying goes, every barrel of honey has a spoonful of tar. Once, while surveying the territory with the dog. He stumbled upon a man setting traps for predatory animals. Getting closer, he saw that they were intended for wolves. As the stranger noticed Tikhon. The dog growled and assumed a defensive stance. I can't recall giving you permission for hunting. This year, it's scarce, and there are few wolves left in the area. That's why I'm determined to catch them alive. I strictly forbid shooting, Tikhon declared. I don't care what you issued, but hunting predators this season is banned. Everyone knows that besides them. The deer and roe deer populations need to be controlled. Without enough food, the wildlife will starve. And start ravaging crops and orchards. What's to be done then, the stranger asked. Maybe we can come to an agreement. Butting heads with a redhead? They call me Bash. I'm a hunter by trade and also deal with taxidermy in my free time. I even have an order for a wolf from here, you know. There's a cunning alpha leader around. I suppose you've seen him, the unpleasant man informed in a confidential tone. Smoothly transitioning to informal address. I might have seen him, but while I'm here. I won't allow you to kill any animals. So pack up your traps and head to the village. Before the blizzard starts, Tikhon commanded. Proker grudgingly complied, collecting his traps and making his way home. Bending under the weight of the load. His knife practically touching the ground, he headed home. Since then, poachers, learning about his refusal and stubbornness. Had harbored resentment towards him. Winter passed relatively peacefully, the snow piled up almost to the roofs. And few dared to venture beyond the outskirts of the village. But as the fickle march arrived on the horizon. The days grew noticeably longer and the snow cover began to dwindle. The poachers made their presence felt again. One day, while busy around the yard. Agar heard gunshots and loud barking. Hurriedly donning his coat and accompanied by the dog. Tikhon rushed into the forest. Prashka, the redhead, was on the opposite bank. Along with his comrades. Driving a pack of wolves towards the river. He knew that the ice in March was too thin. And the predators wouldn't risk crossing the water. This meant that cornered, they would become excellent targets for their guns. The scoundrel was already calculating in his mind. How much he could get from selling wolf skins and the alpha's head. Drive them over there. Where the ice is almost melted. They won't have anywhere to go, Proker commanded, reloading his gun. 
Seeing everything, Tikhan's breath was taken away. He knew he couldn't stop the poachers until he got to the other side. In the meantime, the hunters turned their attention to him. V6. Meanwhile, the wolves were desperately clinging to their lives. Advancing towards the riverbank. The frozen surface was covered in cracks. And every step was treacherous. Possibly leading to sinking into the icy water that would instantly freeze the weakening body. The wolf leader turned and spotted the approaching hunters. Being experienced, he managed the pack intelligently, trying to keep them as far from human habitation as possible. He never harassed domestic livestock. Knowing that people would seek revenge for it with all their inherent cruelty. And now, despite that, the hunters had come to take lives. The wolf leader decided to take the risk and was the first to trot across the ice. Behind him, others followed, stepping in his tracks. The members of the pack moved cautiously, their weight putting pressure on the ice that still held. Seeing this scene, the poachers were stunned. Enthralled, they opened their mouths. Watching as the wolves, playfully dancing with death, dashed over the ice, which was cracking under their paws. Shooting didn't make sense to the poachers. They wanted animal hides as trophies. Tikhan, carefully navigating the ice from the opposite bank, noticed a large opening in the ice ahead of the wolves. The wolves were headed right toward it. The dog, pressed against Tikhan's leg, growled and rumbled. Help them, can't you see what's happening? Tikhan said as he patted the dog's neck. Struck with a desperate idea. Tikhan became a whirlwind of action. He desperately wanted one thing, to prevent the wolves from perishing. Tikhan's efforts were successful. The wolves managed to escape to the safety of the forest. As they vanished into the woods, Tikhan was finally able to breathe a sigh of relief. At that moment, the ice beneath his feet silently gave way, plunging him waist-deep into the freezing water. His fur-lined coat quickly turned into a leaden guillotine. Panicked, he tried to cling to the crumbling ice. The icy water was making his muscles cramp. But the barking dog came running, impatiently pacing nearby. Quivering from the cold, Tikhan tucked himself into the dog's dense fur. And attempted to hoist himself out of the water. The dog realized what his master wanted and put forth extra effort to pull him out. Eventually, through incredible exertion, they managed to retrieve Tikhan from the water. Crawling on all fours, Tikhan skirted the dangerous area and headed towards the shore. Finally reaching solid ground. Suddenly, he noticed the wolf leader watching him intently from the forest. The predator's glowing eyes locked onto him for a moment. And then, as if in farewell, the wolf vanished into the woods. Tikhan hastened away, attempting to move as quickly as possible. He reached his watchtower and saw figures in the distance. It seemed that Prashka and his accomplices had crossed the river in a narrow spot and were now hurrying towards him. Although it was warm inside the hut, Tikhan was shivering as he sipped tea with honey. Wrapped in blankets, partly due to his efforts, he managed to stave off the worst of the cold. But by morning, he couldn't get out of bed. He was running a high fever. Shivering, he scribbled a note on a piece of paper. And attached it to the dog's collar. Batman, as he had nicknamed the dog. Was a smart creature, often sent on errands by Tikhan. In the note, Tikhan requested a medic from the village chairman. As steps approached his hut, a clear, girlish voice sang out. Knock, knock, who lives in this little hut? May I come in? Tikhan mumbled something incomprehensible and drifted into a stupor. After inspecting him, the young woman swiftly prepared a herbal remedy and administered it to him. Drink this, and take it three times a day. I'll come back tomorrow, she said as she left. Thank you, Tikhan whispered with effort before sinking into a deep sleep. Lena visited every day for two weeks. Care and skillful treatment worked their magic. 
and the hunter's health began to improve. Thank you, Lenochka, you saved me from the other side. Tikhan thanked the young woman. It's my duty, and besides, we've met before. Remember the orphanage? I had such long braids back then, Lena asked. Tikhan struggled to recall, but the memory was distant, it had been a long time. Lena continued to care for him. And as the snow melted during Tikhan's recovery, the poachers took advantage of his weakness. Ignoring Tikhan's condition, they roamed freely, even in his absence. Tikhan had set up cunning traps along the paths to deter the poachers. And he marked the area with a pungent substance that kept animals away. One morning, Prashka and his gang descended upon a deer trail. The hunters drove the wolves towards Tikhan's traps. Unaware of the imminent danger. One by one, the poachers started disappearing into the ground. The pitfalls were narrow and deep. Making it nearly impossible to escape. At the end of the path. Tikhan and his loyal dog, Batman, were waiting. The wolves, which the poachers had pursued, darted past without even looking at Tikhan. The pack leader seemed to remember the favor and the service that Tikhan had provided, sparing him. However, a cunning poacher named Proka was immune to Tikhan's traps. He detected the scent of turpentine emanating from one of the pitfalls and avoided it. What are you up to, Proka? Why did you start this slaughter? Tikhan asked as the poacher emerged from hiding. Or do you think there will be no justice for you? The poachers who emerged from hiding encircled Tikhan and his dog. Batman growled fiercely at the redhead ringleader. Poised to leap. But Proka fired first. The wounded dog managed to knock him off his feet. But he himself couldn't escape. Proka's bite clamped down on the dog's throat. And the convulsions ran through his body. The dog's eyes turned cloudy. Gazing into the distance. Tikhan rushed forward and saw his faithful companion dying before his eyes. Overwhelmed by bitterness and despair. Meanwhile, Proka, capitalizing on the chaos, fled. You won't escape, you scoundrel. Tikhan roared after him. But the exertion soon took its toll, and he found it difficult to run. In the distance, Proka's joyful laughter floated back. Ignorant of the lurking wolf's watchful eyes. The forest's justice unfolded swiftly. The wolves quickly closed in on Proka. Who had nowhere to run. With the wolves' eerie eyes upon him. The forest's tribunal was swift and ruthless. The poacher met his end. Unable to fend off the wolves. His fate was sealed by the very creatures he had hunted and tormented. Tikhan called for backup on his radio. The remaining poachers were captured and brought to justice. Their weapons were found along with incriminating evidence. The corrupt official who had aided the gang was removed from his post. And a criminal case was initiated against him. But most importantly, the wolves had enacted their own forest justice. The wolves had pronounced their verdict on Proka. Tikhan's efficient operation earned him a commendation, recognizing his success. The wolf's swift response, guided by Tikhan, had brought retribution for all the animals that had been hunted and killed by the poachers. Tikhan was provided with a ticket for two to a sanatorium by the sea. But he hesitated. He eventually decided to take Lena with him. The warm waves of the Black Sea were rumored to have soothing powers. Lena and Tikhan grew close during their stay. When they returned to their home in the taiga. They planned to celebrate their wedding. As for Batman, his tale ended tragically. But his loyalty and bravery were celebrated. The wolf pack's justice. A force of nature, had prevailed against the enemies of the forest. The lion was wrapped around his neck by wire for three years. And you can imagine how torturous and painful it was for him. But unlike human beings, he could not use his arms flexibly. And he could not use some tools. The bondage of wire made his life greatly shackled. Until one day after three years. 
he finally got rid of this shackle. In fact, the lives of animals are always in danger. Due to human factors. Such as human desire for a certain part of rare animals. Or just the mentality of seeking novelty. Poachers will kill these animals and lead to death or even extinction. Many such tragedies spread on the internet. Even if they are as fierce as lions. Their experiences are sometimes shocking. This story about lions happened in Mikumi National Park. Over the years, poachers have frequented the national park. Causing many animals to die or be seriously injured. In 2009, as always, some poachers set traps in the national park. In the hope of catching animals. This is an illegal act. And it is this trap that keeps a young lion in a state of extreme pain for three years. Mikumi Park is Tanzania's fourth largest national park. So there are a wide variety of animals, including elephants, buffaloes, zebras, wildebeests, hyenas, leopards and lions. Which roam freely in the park in search of food. On a sunny afternoon in 2009, a lion cub set out for food. He often went out with other lions in the park. So although he was young, he knew how to hunt. When it arrived at the field, he crawled in the tall grass waiting for the unsuspecting animals to pass by. The young lion didn't know that this would be its last hunt. At least for the next three years. After 20 minutes, the young lion began to get impatient without finding its prey. Besides, the weather became unbearably hot. As time went by, the fasting lion was going to go home. But just as the lion was about to give up hope, it found an antelope. Lions are the second fastest cats in the world. With a top speed of 50 miles per hour, or 80 kilometers per hour. But this speed is only a short burst, which is very exhausting. Which is why lions must approach their prey before attacking. So the lion waited until the antelope was close to him before attacking. But unfortunately it missed the target and the antelope began to run for its life. The young lion was not the kind of hunter who would give up easily. So he began to chase the antelope. And the chase lasted about two minutes until an accident happened. The lion was blinded by the desire to hunt its prey. And did not see the trap set by the poachers. So it crashed directly into it. A strange device with a metal hoop and a bait in the middle. And when the lion put his head into the trap. It immediately slammed shut. The lion tried to break free from the trap, but the trap was merciless, and it would only pull tighter. And as time went by the poor animal still tried to break free. But all to no avail. The sky began to change. Like molten brass, and the daylight began to lose. And soon the moon became the only visible light source. And it looked coldly at the poor lion like a haughty god. The lion was still trying to break free from the trap. And at last at dawn the lion managed to break free from it. But the iron ring still hung around its neck and did not move. The young lion was obviously exhausted. He looked so miserable that he could only lie alone on the grass. Sadly, this would be the beginning of a terrible life. After a while, the lion, who had regained some strength, got up to seek his friend. When the trap had plunged deep into his flesh. When the injured lion found the herd. The herd saw that he was badly hurt. And they sympathized with him. Sadly, all they could provide was their love. Spiritual support and care. Obviously, none of them could take the iron hoop from his neck. As time went by. The lion's condition worsened. His wounds became infected. And each day the iron ring plunged deeper into the lion's neck. Making it difficult for him to run, breathe, or eat. And the poor animal was in a miserable situation. Its wounds continued. And the discomfort caused by the trap made it impossible for it to move freely. So how did it survive, and would he starve to death? Yes, because of the iron ring, the lion could not hunt. And would probably starve to death. But fortunately his family came to save him. 
and they brought him food every day. And so on for three years. Whenever they go hunting, they always come back with the lion's share of food. They never tire of it. This is probably the friendship between animals. Sometimes, the feelings between them are much deeper than we think. Now that food is out of the way. What about the iron ring around the lion's neck? Can it be freed from it? A few months later, the park rangers finally noticed the injured lion. And they started a rescue mission to remove the iron ring from his head. Obviously, their work was not smooth. Otherwise it would not have lasted for three years. When they started tracking the lion. The lion kept away from them. The lion, who had experienced being hurt by poachers traps. Was afraid of and wary of human beings. It began to hide in the distant wilderness. So the rangers could not find it. Besides, it had the protection of relatives. Who wouldn't let anyone near it. In the end, they can only turn to a wildlife rescue team. The operation to save the animal began. And the team members were divided into several groups, each of which was assigned different tasks. The first group was tasked with catching the lion. And sedated it to take off the iron ring. While the other group had to drive away the lion's relatives. All the teams did their best. And within a few days they finally sedated the lion and cut off the iron ring around its neck. This is an easy thing to say, but difficult to do. Because if they take longer to save the lion, the trap will make it unable to breathe and die. A team of veterinarians treated the animal, and then they released him. The rescue ended the lion's pain and torture for three years. Since the successful rescue operation, the lion has often visited the site where rescuers removed the iron ring from his neck. Although he is not too close to there, he always stares at the place for a few minutes and then walks away. Rangers think this is a way for the lion to express his gratitude. And he is very grateful to these rescuers for helping him get rid of his torture. A few months later, the lion appeared in people's field of vision again. This time, many things changed. And the lion's muscles increased a lot. The lion is now walking happily in the wild. But the scar on his neck is like a reminder of his painful experience. But will this be the last lion to suffer at the hands of poachers? Perhaps all we can do is curb poaching. Sadly, since the tiger population declined, there is an increasing demand for lion claws and bones. In parts of the Far East, Researchers have proved that the lion population is rapidly decreasing. Fortunately, there are some projects that are rapidly becoming active. Such as Tanzania's project, other parts of Africa and even the whole world. They are set up to protect national park areas. Mainly responsible for combating poaching activities. Hopefully, projects like this will help protect the future of wildlife.